Welcome to Gauss Open. I'm your host, Christopher Fisher. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about separating Socrates from Plato. Here's a newsflash. Socrates was not Plato. Plato was not Socrates. I know, big shocker, right? Two different people are, in fact, two different people. And sometimes people confuse this. Often when you talk about Platonism, Neoplatonism, you talk about anything. I, I had my podcast on Manichaeanism, and uh, people were in the comments commenting and taking exception to my calling Manichaeanism semi-Christians, right? That's what Robert Lane Fox, he calls the Manichaeans uh, semi-Christian. They're like, they weren't semi-Christian. They're not Christian, blah, 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 blah. Uh, you, you get these people who think they know something about something commenting. They're not arguing with me. They're arguing with Robert Lane Fox. And if you turn to Augustine's work on Manichaeanism, and Augustine was a Manichae, uh, Augustine treats them like Christians. He calls them Christians. He, he basically considers them a sect of Christianity. And so you got these people on the internet, uh, I would call them midwits. They are smarter than maybe average people, and so they think they have some sort of platform on which to criticize others. And so that they're coming against me to criticize Robert Lane Fox. Uh, go for it. But uh, I think my new New Year's resolution is not to deal, not to interact with these idiots anymore. But anyways, uh, back to Plato. I was on this forum and uh, someone said, what's your problems with uh, Calvinism? And I pointed out, well, it's basically Platonism. Calvinism is Platonism. And this Calvinist, oh, you know, they they get real arrogant. He had a degree in a degree in philosophy. Ah, hmm. So that means apparently he must be an expert on Plato, right? And so, what's his reply? He says, "Oh no, no, they, they're not the same thing. Uh, Pl Calvinism can't be Platonism because didn't you know Plato was a polytheist?" It's like, okay, what what does one thing have to do with the other? Does does Plato being a polytheist mean? Let's pretend it's true. Does Plato being a polytheist mean Calvinism is not Platonism? No, that doesn't follow. You, you missed a step there. You're, you're missing something. Um, it's, it's not adding up. And then second of all, Plato wasn't a polytheist. So I point this out to the guy. I said, uh, um, Plato was a monotheist. You know, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't add uh, too much evidence right away. But, you know, Justin Martyr called him a monotheist. Uh, you, you got the works of Plotinus, Plotinus here, and he's definitely a monotheist, and he considered himself just an advocate of pure Platonic doctrine. He didn't think he was adding anything novel to the works of Plato. These people, definite monotheists, are Platonists, consider themselves true Platonists, dedicate their lives to Platonism, they're monotheists, right? And so his evidence that Plato was, in fact, a polytheist is he'd point to like maybe a passage in the Republic. And I pointed back out to him. It's like, who's speaking in that passage? <laughs> who's speaking? I don't see the name Plato anywhere. I, I see instead, uh, there's a different name going on there. There's a name Socrates going on there. So, so did Plato, are you, you're getting from the words of Socrates that Plato was in fact a polytheist? You might be missing something there. And then they go into their big little spiel thing where they're like, oh, you just don't understand how to read Plato. It's like, I don't think you do. I don't think you do. So I need, I need to stop dealing with these idiots, even, even idiots with degrees. I, I found a meme actually on uh, Twitter the other day. I'm going to pull that up. So I thought it was actually pretty funny. We'll pull that over here. So what it is, it's a, it's a picture of high IQ people, high IQ people of uh, 130 plus and low IQ people of less than 100. And they're shaking hands. They're in agreement. So dumb people and really smart people are in agreement. And uh, what are they in agreement of? So under 100 IQ, doesn't respect your university or degree, thinks you're an utter moron. Plus 130 IQ, doesn't respect your university or degree, thinks you're an utter moron. And then there's a picture of the you know midwits, people at the, the 110s and 120s uh, crying. And there's the caption, 100 through 130 IQ believes everything you say because you studied a particular subject at a particular university. And let me tell you something about degrees. So I got a uh, double major, political science, computer science. I have minors in math and economics. And what, what, which ones of those do you think were very much value added to my information set? And not so much political science. They, they didn't really teach me anything I didn't already know. 
not really computer science. I knew most everything in computer science that they tried to teach me in university for computer science. It was actually the math and the econ. I don't, I don't go study math on my own. And economics was a fairly new field to me. So I had value added there. But most of these people with degrees, you know, it's not hard to get a degree. You look at these master programs. I had a guy working for me who was going for his master's and it was an online class. And the people he was interacting with in the forums in his class, absolute morons. They give these degrees to absolutely anyone. So they're not to be respected. A degree uh, is only as good as the person behind the degree. So they need to demonstrate they know what they're talking about. And someone claiming that Plato was a polytheist is not demonstrating very good, very good education. Uh, probably not worth dealing with. So I'm going to try in my life to stop dealing with these people who don't know anything that they're talking about. But we're, today we're talking about that. We're talking about Plato. We're talking about Socrates and how to differentiate the two. What were the beliefs of them and how did they vary? How can we tell when we're reading Plato? What is Socrates and what is Plato? Just a little uh, quick rant right there, but uh, we're going to turn to Lloyd P. Gerson's book on Plotinus. I got it pulled up here. A beautiful book. Um, best book on Plotinus out there. I don't think there's too many books on Plotinus, but it'll really help you understand Plotinus his uh, body of work, what he believed, and why. But we're going to see what he says about uh, Plato, Plotinus and his interaction with Plato. He says, we know that Plotinus considered himself simply a disciple of Plato. So when there's people out there, what happened on that Schuyler Fiction talk I had when I pointed out Christianity is very much Platonism, and there are people in the comments saying, oh no, not Platonism. Neoplatonism. Well, well, guess what? Neoplatonism is a subset of Platonism. And people like Plotinus, they believed that they were teaching true Platonic doctrine. They didn't think that they were adding anything novel or new. They were faithful disciples of Plato in their own minds. This, this, is, this is the philosophy that they dedicated their lives to. This was their mindset. They are Platonists. They didn't consider themselves Neoplatonists. They were followers of Plato. Anyways, uh, here's what Lloyd Garrison says. Neoplatonist is a term of art and indicates a measure of critical revision that may have in fact occurred, but of which Plotinus is seemingly unaware. If Plotinus had commentaries on Aristotle read and discussed, it was evidently not because he approached Aristotle with the eye of a neutral scholar. Thinking that the doctrines of Plato embodied wisdom, Plotinus correctly recognized that the greatest challenge to this position came from Aristotle. The reading of Aristotelian commentaries was, I suggest, part of a definite strategy to understand the essence of Aristotelian objections to Plato in order to provide their proper responses. So Plotinus read Aristotle with an eye to defend Plato. It's interesting that Plotinus gets a lot of his understanding of Plato's actual teachings from Aristotle's criticism of Plato, and not necessarily from Plato's actual written works. We read on. An additional and sometimes overlooked facet of Plotinus's Platonism is that Plotinus leans heavily on Aristotle for an understanding of what Plato's doctrines actually were. For one thing, Plotinus's Plato is sharply distinguished from Socrates, Following that perfect natural distinction in Aristotle, nothing in the Aeneads is derived or depends on what we have come to recognize as especially Socratic. Isn't that funny? It, I'll read that again. Nothing in the Aeneads is derived from or depends on what we have come to recognize as especially Socratic. More importantly, Plotinus follows Aristotle in holding that Plato had an unwritten doctrine of principles. Oh, imagine that. He had, had his own little uh, mystery religion going on. He had his secret principles that he didn't share with the world. Uh, the world who would uh, kill people for revealing certain mystery features and people who will kill people for not honoring the gods, as was Socrates. That's, that's what Socrates, one of his crimes he was accused of was uh, corrupting the youth and uh, teaching to forego honors to the gods. This is Socrates's crime. And we'll read that in Xenophone. We'll, we'll pull up Xenophone just a little bit later. 
Indeed, Plotinus appears to rely on Aristotle for understanding what that is. Some effort is expended in the Aeneads in order to show that this unwritten doctrine is at least consistent with that which appears in the dialogues. Finally, Plotinus will frequently accept as authoritative an interpretation of Plato by Aristotle, an interpretation which Aristotle himself thinks leads a Platonic doctrine to shipwreck. Plotinus, however, will typically attempt to show that what Aristotle thinks is a disastrous consequence of a Platonic position is in fact true and even necessary. The alternative Aristotelian position is what ought to be rejected, and yet where Plotinus judges that Aristotle is really not in disagreement with Plato, he will quietly adopt Aristotle's terminology, distinctions, and even his explicit conclusions. He concludes this section, in light of the above, I have frequently begun my treatment of Platonian doctrines with the reasons why Plotinus rejects Aristotelian alternative. I have found this approach enormously illuminating. Plotinus is primarily a Platonist, not an anti-Aristotelian, but his Platonism is in many respects filtered through his struggle with Aristotle. All right, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this clip. And this clip is going to just kind of give us an overview of the differences between the Socratic method and the Platonic dialectic. So we have this concept that's very important, I think, in our culture of the Socratic dialogue, but we learn of it mostly through Plato. That's true. And they're different. And that difference is a very interesting difference. The difference between the Socratic dialogue and the Platonic dialectic. Yes. Yes. Um, Alcibiades and Socrates' great dialogue, the Symposium, uh, appears at, at the end of the Symposium where everybody is talking about the nature of love. And he says, wait a minute, I'm not going to compete with that theme, but I'm going to use my talent to tell you something. I'm going to talk about that man, Socrates. And it's his speech about Socrates that we learn things that allow us to make the distinction between Plato and Socrates, because at that point, Alcibiades says, hey, you know, the kind of dialogues that Socrates had were with tanners, merchants. We don't find any dialogue of Plato's dealing with tanners or workmen. Mm -hmm. Second, he says, he had such dialogues within it that they, they, they brought participants to to be in a state where they were crying and being upset and wrapped up in all kinds of states of mind. He said, there were people around him who then imitated him. They became in history called the Socratics, of uh -huh. which we know nothing because all the records have been destroyed. How interesting. Yeah. So that Plato, therefore, is different than Socrates. Mm -hmm. Because his dialogues, you don't read them and find that people are so upset and they get into more complicated or, in fact, even elevated states of mind. He often ends where the individual recognizes the nature of their own ignorance, and he leaves it at that. Plato does. Plato, mm -hmm. not Socrates. But Socrates does almost the opposite. He, he goes to working class people, and he asks them, how do you do what you do? And they, they can't mm -hmm. always tell him, yeah. and yet he begins asking questions to bring out the fact that they actually can articulate aspects of their art, their trade, their profession that they, prior to that, weren't able to articulate. All right, so what we kind of understand from this clip is that the two individuals, Plato and Socrates, had a different approach to conversations. They had different goals for interactions. Socrates actually tried to attempt to send people away with practical advice. He wanted to get to the root of some sort of matter to flush out things that people already knew to send them away with life-changing information, whereas Plato sought to delve into deeper truths, and often the people walked away dejected. This is actually the picture we get of Socrates in Xenophon. So we're going to turn to Xenophon's memorabilia and just be thinking about this picture of Socrates that we are learning about. And think how, how fitting or unfitting this is of Socrates as we might see him in Platonic dialogues such as Timaeus. 
Let's look how he starts this. In the first place, what evidence did they produce that Socrates refused to recognize the gods acknowledged by the state? Remember in the Republic where uh, Socrates is trying to ban all mention of the gods because the gods have illicit affairs. They do things that are unworthy of godhood. And uh, contrast this to what is said in Memorabilia. In the first place, what evidence did they produce that Socrates refused to recognize the gods acknowledged by the state? Was it that he did not sacrifice, that he dispensed with divination? On the contrary, he was often seen engaging in sacrifice at home at the common altars of the state, nor was his dependence on divination less manifest. Scrolling down, this is a very, very interesting passage. Yet no one ever heard Socrates say or saw him do anything impious or irreverent. Irreverent like saying that the gods should be banished? That might be a little bit irreverent. Indeed, in contrast to the others, he set his face against all discussion of such high matters as the nature of the universe. <laughs> wait, wait a minute, what? Let me read that again. He says, uh, Indeed, in contrast to others, he set his face against all discussions of such high matters as the nature of the universe. Turn to Timaeus. Timaeus is all about the creation of the world by some demiurge and the uh, nature of time and an uh, unchanging being outside of time. Contrast that with what Xenophon is telling us about Socrates. Socrates doesn't care about the nature of the cosmos. Keeping, keeping on, let's, let's keep going on. It says, how the cosmos, as the savants phrase it, came into being. He didn't care about those things. That is specifically described in Timaeus. But apparently, Socrates doesn't care about it. Or by what forces the celestial phenomenon arise to trouble one's brain about such matters was, he argued, to play the fool. Huh. He would ask first, did these investigators feel their knowledge of things human so complete that they betook themselves of these lofty speculations? So Socrates, he's focused on the human element, things about us, things that are practical and worldly, things that we can have use of, rather than lofty divinity type stuff. The formation of the universe, the, the nature of metaphysics, that's not in the realm of, of uh, Socrates, his, his normal teaching, right? As we've already read in Lloyd Gerson, that there, there's a definite filtering out of Socrates that needs to happen in order to get to true Platonism. The Platonists, the Platonists understood this, apparently modern day uh, <laughs> philosophy students with degrees do not understand this. Did these investigators, I'm, I'm just rewinding a little bit, did these investigators fill their knowledge of human things so complete that they betook themselves to these lofty speculations, or did they maintain that they were playing their proper parts in thus neglecting the affairs of man to speculate on the concerns of God? The concerns of God are his own concerns. They're not our concerns, according to Xenophon's picture of Socrates. He, this is Socrates, he was astonished they did not see how far these problems lay beyond mortal kin, since even those who pride themselves most on their discussion of these points differ from each other as madmen do. So this metric, this is critical for understanding Platonism. When we come across scenes in Plato's works about the divinities, the nature of the universe, we, we could be fairly confident we are getting a picture, an insight into Plato's own mind. This almagation, the Socrates that he's presenting, yeah, it's half real Socrates, I don't know, half, but it's part real Socrates and part Plato's uh, character, his, his method of introducing his own concepts. So it's not that everything Socrates ever says in every single dialogue is Platonic. No, it's not. But Socrates acts as a vehicle for communicating to the masses uh, secret, often secret, Platonic doctrines. Things that Plato might be, maybe, just going out on a limb here, his, uh, his mentor was executed by the state. Maybe, maybe Plato was a little bit, uh, he didn't want to put his own name there, because sometimes they executed people for the, so, some of the thoughts that uh, were being propagated. So maybe 
maybe Socrates is acting as a vehicle to covertly get out Platonic doctrine. And maybe this was picked up by people like Justin Martyr, who admitted that Plato was a monotheist. That's that's what they believed. And uh, funny that Justin Martyr, he points to the wide popularity of Plato in his defense of Christianity, saying these guys believe what we believe. <laughs> They're monotheists too. Uh, that we're, we're, the same, we're the same kin. And, and Justin Martyr was a Platonist in his prior life before Christianity. He knows what he's talking about. And uh, I don't think that Plotinus, our good friend Plotinus, I don't think he's ignorant either. I think he's onto something that Plato's doctrine can be extracted from the character of Socrates. And it's not to com be confused with everything that's presented. And even if some of these dialogues talk about the gods, in what way are they being introduced? In what way are they being talked about? Does Plato himself except the reality of the gods. Remember what Palfrey does with Christianity. He criticizes Christians for claiming that they were polytheists. So the Christians claim that Palfrey was polytheist, and his criticism back to them was, uh, you're polytheist. You, get, you guys got angels. And what's the difference between your angels and our pantheon of gods? They still report to this higher being, this higher god, and in Platonism, and Palfrey was a Neoplatonist, in Platonism, it was this one. And so in Palfrey's Platonism, and in a lot of other Platonism as well, uh, the, the Greek gods still existed, but they were kind of lesser deities. They're like the demiurges, the, the, the intermediators who weren't quite God, uh, but they were very powerful beings who operated maybe like demons, like angels, no different than Christianity. You know, that's the argument. He criticizes the Christians for having a double standard. Rightly so. Rightly so he does that. Th this, is, this is what we learn from Xenophone. But if it was his mode of describing those things who meddle with such matters as these, he himself never wearied of discussing human topics. What is piety? What is impiety? What is beautiful? What is ugly? What is noble? What is base? What are meant by just and unjust? What is sobriety? What is madness? By what courage and cowardice? What is a state? What is a statement? What is a ruler over men? What is a ruling character and like problems? The knowledge of which, as he put it, conferred a patent of nobility on the possessor, wherever those who lack the knowledge might deservedly be stigmatized as slaves. Socrates focused on the practical. Plato was very much impractical. What do you do with metaphysics? You just sit and think about it. And then I guess in Platonism, you ascend as we read in Timaeus, where you could ascend, you could go through this inward meditation ascent to try to aspire to more heavenly realms or, or try to return to the one as is in Platonism. That, that's the goal of Platonism. A good Platonist will try to use introspection to ascend to higher levels of being to try to remerge with the one. I think it's important to point out a couple more sources, at least, who say the same thing. I'm not making this up. So one thing I do, I try to present all my sources. You can read my sources. You can make up your mind for yourself. It's, it's not like these things are coming from me. I'm just reinforcing commonly accepted ideas and so we got uh who's this guy we got walter parker and uh, he has this section on plato and socrates and he says plato we habitually when we talk about our teachers in the republic the fairness a cutting knot for plato speaks to us indirectly only in his dialogues by the voice of platonic socrates a figure most ambiguously compacted of the real Socrates and Plato himself. So Socrates in the dialogues, an omegation of the views of Socrates and Plato. We need to separate them out. We need to figure out what is the real Socrates, what is the real Plato. A purely dramatic invention. It might perhaps have been fancied, or so to speak, an idolon theatri, Plato's self, but presented with the reserve appropriate to his fastidious genius in a kind of stage disguise. Plato's disguising his own beliefs in the form of Socrates. So we might fancy, but for certain independent information we possessed about Socrates in Aristotle and in the memorabilia of Xenophon. 
The Socrates of Xenophon is one of the simplest figures in the world. We reread that already. We saw Xenophon's picture of Socrates. He cared about things that are practical. It's funny that in the symposium, Plato's symposium, there's an end speech that talks about who Socrates was. And one of the characters goes on this big rant about Socrates talks to all sorts of tradesmen and he moves them to tears. He moves them passionately inside themselves. Uh, this is not a picture that we get from the other dialogues of Plato. Plato is presenting us perhaps a realistic picture of the true Socrates, one that's not presented in his other works, one that actually fits the Socrates that we read in Xenophon, where he's someone who actually interacts with people, interacts and is not impious. He interacts about practical things and can move people. The Socrates of Xenophon, going back to the book, Socrates of Xenophon is one of the simplest figures in the world. From the personal memories of that singularly limpid writer, the outline of the great teacher detaches itself as an embodiment of all that was clearest in the now adult Greek understanding, the adult Greek conscience. All that Socrates is seen to be in those unaffected pages may be explained by the single desire to be useful to ordinary young men, whose business in life would mainly be with practical things, and at first sight as delineators of their common master. Plato and Xenophon might seem scarcely reconcilable, but then, as Alcibiades alleges of him in the Symposium, Socrates had been ever in all respects a two-sided being. Like some rude figure of Silenus, he suggests by way of an outer case for the image of a god within. He concludes this paragraph by saying, It is a problem about which probably no reader of Plato ever quite satisfies himself. How much precisely he must deduct from Socrates as we find him in the dialogues by way of defining to himself the Socrates of fact. It's our job. We need to figure out who the real Socrates was. And... More importantly, for my purposes, who is the real Plato? What does Plato believe? Are the Neoplatonists, are they correct about their, their assumptions, their ideas of Plato's philosophy? Was Plato a proponent of the one, the, the one that uh, Plotinus offers, right? So for the next part of this podcast, we're going to actually turn to some works of Plato to see if we can't tease out Socrates from Plato. And we are now in the Republic. We are looking at book three. And Socrates in the Republic wants to ban all mention of the Greek myths, where the gods do things which are, quote unquote, bad. And here's Socrates speaking. Yes, Adamantus, these are not stories to be repeated in our state. The young man should not be told that in committing the worst crimes, he is far from doing anything outrageous, and even if he chastises his father when he does wrong in whatever manner, he will only be following the example of the first and greatest among the gods. Remember, Zeus overthrew his father, Kronos. Scrolling down, this is the other individual. Very true, he said, but what are these forms of theology which you mean? Socrates, something of this kind, I replied. God is always to be represented as he truly is. Whatever be the sort of poetry, epic, lyric, or tragedy in which the representation is given. Right? And is he not truly good? And must he not be represented as such? Certainly. And no good thing is harmful? No, indeed. And which is not hurtful hurts not? Certainly not. And that which hurts not does no evil? No. And can that which does no evil be a cause of evil? Impossible. And the good is advantageous? Yes. And therefore the cause of well-being? Yes. It follows, therefore, that the good is not the cause of all things, but the good only. Assuredly, then God, if he be good, is not the author of all things, as many assert, but he is the cause of the few things only, and not of most things that occur to men. For few are the goods of human life, and many are the evils, and the good is to be attributed to God alone. Of the evils, the causes ought to be sought elsewhere and not from him. This appears to be most true, he said. Scrolling down, And what do you think of a second principle? Shall I ask you whether God is a magician and of a nature to appear insidiously 
now in one shape and now in another, sometimes himself changing and passing into many forms, sometimes deceiving us with the semblance of such transformations, or is he one and the same, immutably fixed in his own proper image? Immutability. We first talked about the good. God can only be good and not do any harm or evil. And we are getting into what does it mean to be good in Platonism. And I got a list of quotes of modern philosophers who echo this Platonic rule throughout Christian history. You hear Christians say it all the time. That which changes can only change for the worse. Therefore, God cannot change. This is their proof text for immutability. We find it in the works of Plato from the mouth of Socrates. And remember, Xenophon says Socrates doesn't care about these things. But what Plato does Plato cares about these things. I cannot answer you, he said, without more thought. Well, I said, if we suppose a change in anything, that change must be affected either by the thing itself or some other thing, most certainly. And things which are at their best are least liable to be altered or discomposed. For example, when the healthiest and the strongest, the human frame is least liable to be affected by meats and drinks, and the plant which is at the fullest vigor also suffers least from the winds or from the heat or the sun or any similar causes. Of course, and will not the bravest and wisest soul be least confused or deranged by an external influence? True. And the same principle, as I should suppose, applies to all composite things, furniture, houses, garments. When good and well made, they are least altered by time and circumstances. Very true. Then everything which is good, whether made by art or nature or both, is least liable to suffer change from without. True. But surely God and the things of God are in every way perfect. Of course they are. He can hardly be compelled by external influences to take many shapes. He cannot, but may he not change and transform himself? Clearly, he said, and must be the case if he is changed at all. And will he then change himself for the better, for the fairer, or for the worse and more unsightly? If he changed at all, he can only change for the worse, for we cannot suppose him to be deficient either in virtue or beauty. Very true, Adamantius, but then one would say, whether God or man, desire to make himself worse impossible then it is impossible that god should ever be willing to change being as is supposed the fairest and best that is conceivable every god remains absolutely and forever in his own form that necessarily follows he said in my judgment then i say my dear friend let none of the poets tell us that the gods taking the disguises of strangers from other lands walk up and down the cities in all sorts of forms look at this not Socrates. It's not Socrates. This is Plato. He's talking about the things of God, the form of God. God must be immutable. God can't take shape. God can't take form. He's for, forever immutable in himself without change or variation because any change would be a change for the worse. Degradation. Even though this is coming from the mouth of Socrates. Does that sound like the Greek gods? Does that sound like a polytheist if the gods are immutable? The god has to be a god, right? So it can't be plural. Can't be plural. They're talking about here. God is immutable. Is Plato a monotheist? All right, we're going to stop there. But to quickly summarize, Socrates is not Plato, and Plato is not Socrates. The character of Socrates that we find within the works of Plato is an almagation between the ideas that Plato wants to introduce into society and the ideas of Socrates, not necessarily one and the same, and a lot of subversions going on in this character, covert operations, covert telling of uh, unnamed theories and ideas, ideas that Plato keeps secret, as they often did in the ancient world. They kept their ideas of ascension and enlightenment secret, only meant for typically the the elect, the individuals that were in the know and not generally accessible to everyone. So Plato cared about the things of metaphysics. He cared about uh, introspection. He cared about how the world functions and works, whereas Socrates, he cared about practicality. He cared about giving people useful information to better their lives. He cared about things of practical value. In this sense, in this sense, we're able to tease out what is true Platonism from what is uh, Socrates, what is not true Platonism, what is perhaps 
some sort of front that is put on by this character in this text in order to disguise a philosophy that underlies the system. Plato was a monotheist. Plato was a monotheist. He believed in immutability. He believed in the good. He believed basically in the one that Plotinus defines centuries later. This is his idea of God, which is Calvinism. These guys are quote-unquote Calvinists. Calvinists are kind of a bastardized, bastardized Platonists. That's probably the better way of describing Calvinism, but they're all the same school. They're, they're competing sects of the same school. Anyways, you got questions and comments, put that down below. <laughs>